All right, this is OpenStax US History, Chapter 12, Cotton is King, the Antebellum South, 1800 to 1860. We'll be looking at Section 1, the, econ the Economics of Cotton. So this term, antebellum, if you're not familiar, this simply means before the Civil War. And so we'll be looking specifically at the South in the years prior to the Civil War, 1860 being approximately when the Civil War uh, begins or starts, right? So we'll be using that. And one of the major transformations taking place in the Southern United States leading up to the Civil War was the introduction of cotton. So once again, we have this term antebellum, if you're not familiar. And uh, what happened in the South in these years was that it had gone from a society that produced tobacco and rice using African slavery. So that's not what's different. African slavery was used in the Southern colonies and then the Southern states following the American Revolution, uh, practically since the 1600s. But what's changing is the type of crop that's being produced. And it's going from tobacco and rice. Tobacco was typically grown in the Upper South. That would be Virginia mostly. We might add Maryland to that as well. Uh, rice was typically produced in what we call the low country, which included South Carolina and Georgia. And uh, those are being replaced by cotton and cotton simply becomes so profitable that really it doesn't make sense to grow anything else or at least not to invest in anything else because cotton is so profitable. And there are a couple of things that make this possible, specifically changes going on between these years that explain why the United States economy went from tobacco and rice then to growing specifically cotton. One of, there was the, one of them was the cotton gin by Eli Whitney. So Eli Whitney is the inventor of the cotton gin. And what the cotton gin did, it was an invention that removed cotton seeds, we'll say 50 times faster than by doing it by hand, because that's typically the way that the seeds were removed from cotton before. By hand, you invent this contraption that can now remove the seeds 50 times uh, faster it essentially means that you're able to produce more cotton. You can grow more, you can harvest more, you can then uh, remove the seeds and manufacture it. And this cotton, this raw material was then going to industrial textiles, which of course we know the industrial revolution as being based off the steam engine. And of course these factories are built in Europe and the Northern United States. So the North, we mean Northern US and by Europe, we mean mostly Great Britain, but there's also other areas that have some of these textile factories. But, you know, the industrial textiles use the steam engine to produce, right? You know, the industrial revolution is the process of going from handmade to machine made. And just like the cotton gin, which allowed for 50 times the efficiency of removing the seeds going from making things with your hand, which can be very time consuming and you can't produce a lot to making things with machine machines, you essentially can produce 50 times more. And so all of these changes technological from the steam engine to the cotton gin are making cotton a more profitable crop, uh, product to grow. And if you can remove the seeds 50 times faster, if you can produce 50 times more of it, well, then you're also going to need to plant 50 times as much cotton as you did before. And then you require 50 times as many slaves in order to perform that labor. And that's essentially what's going on. Uh, cotton itself was referred to as king cotton. It pretty much came to dominate the Southern economy. You had a huge cotton boom, and of course, cotton was a cash crop. That means you produce to sell it. Uh, at the height 
The United States produced two thirds of the entire global supply of cotton. So this wasn't just a lot of cotton being produced by the standards of the US. This was a lot of cotton being produced by the standards of the entire world. Essentially, the southern United States became the world supplier of cotton, whether that was Europe or, like I said before, the northern uh, cities and northern industries. Um, produce it to sell it two thirds and it was said that cotton is king now cotton had a big impact then on slavery like we said before slavery had existed in the united states but it changed and one of the ways that it changed was that slavery shifted so one way we could say is that slavery shifted right it or it moved where historically most slaves, right, the highest concentration and the highest number were in the upper south. Uh, most uh, or a lot or many of those slaves then were quote unquote sold down the river to new cotton plantations in the deep south. The deep south would be places like uh, Mississippi, uh, might be things like Texas, uh, Arkansas, right? These were territories that were very sparsely populated, but thanks to cotton, because it was so profitable now, it was called white gold. Uh, a lot of plantation owners took their investments, went out to the deep south, which is further west, further south, and brought slaves along with them. So one big change because of cotton was that slavery shifted from the upper south then to the deep south. In other words, it spread, right? It spread. Uh, but also one thing that was true of it as well, and we'll go back up here, right? The ability to remove the seeds 50 times faster, the ability to uh, produce 50 times as much. In addition to uh, spreading, slavery also, actually we'll say the number of slaves increased, right? That's a very important point as well. So not only did it shift further south geographically, but also the number of slaves actually increased because more slaves were required to harvest the cotton, to uh, plow the land, which was particularly uh, uh, necessary there as well because much of the land was wilderness and it needed to be transformed into something that uh, was much more profitable. So what was cotton slavery like? Well, it was working outside, typically in fields and the land. By the time of the Civil War, most of those who were enslaved in the United States worked in cotton fields. Uh, although it wasn't all, it certainly was a majority, that there was no difference between what men did, women, win, women did, or children did, that all slaves, men, women, or children, worked in the fields. So for example, as compared to uh, Northern society to a certain degree, and certainly Southern uh, aristocratic society or upper class society, where there was a division of labor between men and women, right? In the North, there were things that were considered men's work and things that were considered women's work. That didn't apply for slaves. Men, women, and children pretty much all did the same thing. Typically in the fields, you would have a driver or an overseer. This would be some sort of uh, somebody who would just kind of like what the term uh, uh, says would oversee. And if slaves were not working every hour of the day, uh, overseers would employ physical punishment, which included things like whipping. It was very difficult labor. Uh, oftentimes it was uh, not just the harvesting itself, but it was uh, what we might say uh, turning wilderness into plantation. All right, a lot of it was clearing land. And that was very physically demanding, right? And the, the workday was from sunrise to sunset. So cotton was something that was certainly physically demanding in terms of the type of labor that was required. And it was from, sun, or sorry, from sunrise to sunset as it was described. Uh, in terms of the South and how cotton was transported, again, another innovation helped make the transport of cotton much easier, the steamship. We might also add the railroad and we can say that maybe this made it 50 times easier to transport cotton. And so you're beginning to see, once again, I'm gonna just use a different color to sort of mark this distinction. Uh, you're seeing all the causal factors that led to this enormous explosion in the number of slaves in the United States, right? That all these things are more or less requiring 
or make it possible for the number of slaves to actually increase quite dramatically over a very, very short period of time. Uh, New Orleans became a major export. So the Mississippi River was where cotton was exported. And if you had a map of the United States, the Mississippi River would go out. And then right here, right before you got to the ocean, that would be where New Orleans was located. So this became a major commercial city in the south, known mostly for exporting cotton. Cotton went down, down the river. Uh, steamships and railroads made it essentially 50 times easier to transport it. Here you have uh, an illustration of what New Orleans looked like, and you can just see all the bales of cotton that were there getting ready to export, whether they were going to New York City or whether they were going to London, Europe or Manchester or wherever they ended up going. Uh, and so along with cotton, right, you know, cotton was the big transformation, right? The big shift was right here. It was going from an economy based off of tobacco and rice going to an economy based on cotton. But because there was much higher demand for slaves, the second largest industry in the South behind cotton. So cotton was the most valuable industry in the South. The second uh, most valuable industry was the actual slave trade itself. That is the buying and selling of people. Now, one thing that the United States did at the Constitutional Convention was to abolish the Atlantic slave trade in 1808. This was part of the Three-Fifths Compromise between the Northern States and the Southern States. This was done by the insistence of the Northern States. And what this did was that it made illegal importing slaves from other nations, right? So it was illegal after 1808 to purchase slaves from other nations. However, you could still buy and sell slaves from within the United States. And so the domestic slave trade was the buying and selling between the states within the United States. That's not to say that smuggling didn't occur because even though it was technically illegal, you still did have some degree of smuggling. Smuggling is illegal trade. But for the most part, the uh, buying and selling was through this domestic slave trade, again, from the upper south, where families were sold, to the deep south, where they ended up. And this amounted to uh, an internal migration that was one of the largest in US history. And this had an incredibly, this, this slave trade here, had an incredibly devastating impact on uh, slaves and slave families themselves. In terms of the uh, where the South stands in the global um, global economy, like I mentioned before, cotton was shipped all over the world, all over. The United States came to produce about 66% of the world's cotton. But also, even though it was very valuable, even though the South made a lot of money off of cotton, one thing that it also transformed the South into was a, a form of economic dependence. In other words, the South could only make money so far as others buy cotton. So that's one important distinction to make, that practically speaking, although this is not entirely true, there were really no factories in the South, right? And so to be dependent means that you, de you, know, you depend on other parts, specifically the North United States. So even though it was incredibly valuable and cotton made the South very, very, very wealthy, it also made it dependent on those other parts of the world. If the North decided that it wasn't gonna purchase cotton from the South, or if Europe decided that it wasn't gonna purchase cotton from the South, well, you know, the South having transformed its entire economy to this one single crop would find itself in a very, uh, very troubling situation.